Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. So why do we have rules? Generally speaking, they're there to check our behavior. Those who understand the purpose of those rules, or even have simple, blind faith that those who make the rules have a good reason for doing so, will observe and comply with them. Either way, certain actions are deemed undesirable by whoever came up with the rules and found it preferable to restrict it in their personal sphere of influence. Thus, we have things like no stealing and no raping. We can explain why these rules exist, since theft and rape violate self-ownership and therefore cannot possibly be justified. But there are other rules, aren't there? Swimming pools often have rules against running, not because running violates self-ownership, but because you could slip and hurt yourself. The tiles around pools can get slick from water, or even simple rules of preferable behavior, like no talking in the movie theater. Aside from the obvious effects of restricting undesired behavior, rules are meaningless if there's no enforcement mechanism. Someone running at the pool might be kicked out, while the victim of a rapist is justified in shooting their attacker, as is anyone else acting on the victim's behalf. The purpose being to disincentivize bad behavior when explaining the consequences is simply too inefficient. It's easier for a religious person to tell people not to have gay sex because it's a sin and they'll go to hell than it is to explain the higher risk of venereal diseases, including rectal cancer one may suffer as a result of gay sex. Just to list one example. Of course, I think we all understand this. At least, I hope we do. Basic rules that follow deontological ethical standards ensure consistency in the absence of negative outcomes from undesired behavior, while rules that come down to preference are simply socially acceptable. It's also more efficient, since everybody you don't need to spend time explaining and gaining consent from for these rules is time doing something else. But anyways, when we make rules, it's because our goal is compliance. We want people to follow them, don't we? I mean, I mentioned the movie theater example earlier. What movie theater intentionally wants to kick paying customers out of their place of business? A failing movie theater, I'll tell you that. The rules themselves can tell you a lot about the person making the rules and what their motivations are. Naturally, governments create rules too. The statist priesthood has their preferences for how people should and should not behave as reflected in the legislation. For the time being, we're ignoring the morality and ethics of government legislation because I want to make a point about something. If rules reflect the intent of the person creating them, then legislation can as well. With this in mind, what does it say about the people in the government that we have red flag laws? Red flag laws, also sometimes known as extreme risk protection order laws, that's a mouthful, are laws appearing in several state legislatures across America. Depending on the state, they allow family members, police, or in Maryland's case, healthcare workers, to petition courts, presumably criminal court, to sign an order for police to confiscate that person's gun and further restrict their ability to buy additional weapons for a period of a few days up to one year, if the petition is for a temporary order or a final order, respectively. The justification presented is that mass shooters have warning signs, prior altercations with police, and are taking mind-altering SSRIs that have been linked to virtually every mass shooting in the U.S. Oh, wait, we're not supposed to talk about that, are we? But the point is that nobody just wakes up one morning and decides to kill dozens of people. There are all sorts of warning signs that people can take notice of, and this law is designed to stop someone from using firearms before they can hurt someone. So if we give them the benefit of the doubt, they are trying to help people. They are trying to keep people from getting hurt and prevent people from using guns they already have if it's clear they're going to use it to kill someone. Now here's all the reasons their intentions are worthless and it's not going to work. Most people aren't going to know about this law. They have their own lives and you can expect people to make use of these laws even if they're damn certain someone they know is going to kill someone with their guns. I imagine only a few thousand Americans know about this law at all and only a fraction of them are going to be in states with red flag laws. Sure, 
If you have wall-to-wall media coverage and have a concerted campaign to educate people about it, you might be able to boost that number up, but you can be damn sure some people are going to slip through the cracks, not only out of honest ignorance, but the normalcy bias. Normalcy bias goes something like this. Oh, my brother Billy Bob is a good boy. I mean, yes, he keeps to himself a lot, has several maps of the layout of my local school on his computer, and mumbles about how he's going to kill them all. But it's not my brother that's going to be a mass shooter. No, mass shooters are only the family members of other people. Obviously, it won't be that extreme, but you get my point. We, as people, tend to assume ourselves and those around us as the exception. It's easy to look at these mass shootings and think that warning signs were obvious and how red flag laws would have stopped them because hindsight is 2020, isn't it? God forbid this process gets abused. I can completely imagine a situation where an angry ex or a wife attempting to divorce their husband petitions the court for this so as to have the court order on record to bolster her case for why she should have the kids. If police can petition the court for such an order, what's to prevent them from abusing that power, forcing anti-police activists to relinquish the means to defend themselves? Let's not also forget that many of these shooters didn't use guns they owned themselves. The 2012 Aurora, Colorado shooter used his mom's guns, and no red flag law can prevent simple theft, or even if shooters get their weapons from the black market and literally only they know about them. Gun confiscation is happening right now, all under the pretense of vague language, stripping people of their guns because they may pose a threat to themselves or others. How can you tell? Who determines that? How does one know if these concerns are valid or not? More importantly, this is all done in near total secrecy. Someone with an extreme risk protection order issued against them will have no idea about it until the police come knocking at their door, demanding their guns, their property stolen from them without ever having been accused of a crime or with any semblance of due process. The victim, and let's be honest, that's what the accused is, a victim, has no recourse for two to three weeks. And even after that, if they want their property rights restored, they are required to beg to the government courts to let them keep their goddamn property rights, all at the cost of potentially thousands of dollars in both direct legal fees and opportunity costs from days lost at work, which, let's be honest, most people aren't going to bother with, and those that do are not guaranteed success either. Of the 257,000 military veterans reported by the Department of Veterans Affairs, or VA, as having trouble with personal finances who were subsequently barred from owning a firearm for that reason, only about 50 have been able to get their property rights restored. And no, I have no freaking idea why they banned gun ownership on the basis of finances. A bill in the New York State Legislature proposes making any hate speech on social media in the last three years grounds for preventing people from buying a gun. Of course, the criteria for hate speech is purposefully vague, as to be up to the discretion of surly bureaucrats who very well may just not like you because you're a libertarian, because you're a conservative, because you disagree with them, or because you look at them funny. Let's be clear here, that bill is not a red flag bill. But can you honestly say with absolute certainty that at some point in some progressive state like Maryland, police won't see you posting dank memes on social media and use that as a pretense for taking your weapons? What am I talking about? Of course they will. You'll only know about it after they knock on your door and demand that you surrender your weapons. Which of course only puts law-abiding citizens in danger since there's no crime the police won't kill you for, as one Maryland man found out when he was issued such an order on November 6, 2018, at 5.17 a.m. The police say that he answered the door armed, but when armed men come to your door at freaking 5 o'clock in the morning, what do you think is going to happen, you dumbasses? 
American conservatives would point out that this is a gross violation of the Second Amendment as well as the Fifth Amendment. I prefer to see it as a violation of property rights, as the government is unilaterally determining what property they can or cannot take away from you. Look, the Constitution has either authorized the government we have that is creating red flag laws or has been powerless to prevent it. Either way, it will not secure our rights, and it will take five years before this ever gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the meantime, how many people's property rights are going to be violated? Red flag laws are a step closer to unilateral gun confiscation in the U.S., where the government will legislate away your ability to own a particular piece of property. Never mind that they have no ethical justification for doing any of this. They want to maintain their monopoly on violence, and your ability to defend yourself makes you a threat to their power. Why do people need a gun when you can just call the police? This is anecdotal, but I remember when I was a conservative hearing arguments like how the police in the U.S. will refuse to carry out gun confiscation orders. Well, now's the time for them to put up or shut up. So let's circle back a bit. We were talking about rules and what it says about the motives of the rule giver. A referee wants a clean game of basketball for the enjoyment of fans and players. A head chef wants a clean kitchen to maximize the quality of the dining experience through their food. When the rule is passed down from on high from the statist priesthood, whose only claim to authority is winning a popularity contest, the rule being that they can determine what kind of property you are not allowed to own that men with guns must take from you by force should a judge's arbitrary determination of a threat against yourself or others is satisfied. Similarly, they may increase the number of arbitrary reasons they may violate your self-ownership through violating your property rights at any point for any reason they wish, and they may do so with neither your input, consent, or compliance. In fact, if you disagree with their taking of your property and act on that disagreement, they kidnap you and lock you in a cage or simply kill you. So what would possibly be their motives for such a rule? You think this rule is designed to fail? To give the priesthood of statism pretense for even more wide-sweeping gun confiscation than the individualized confiscation which is already taking place? Well, I'll let you decide. Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think their motives are? I'll tell you what I think. They're tyrannical totalitarian assholes! Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.